Hey everyone, Mrs. Anson back. You know, the last time we were together, we were looking at Boyle's Law, PV equal PV, Charles' Law, V over T is V over T, and Gay-Lussac's Law, P over T equal P over T. You go, oh my gosh, that's a lot of letters to remember. I want to encourage you that you do not need to memorize all three separate gas laws. Instead, work to understand their relationship altogether. If I can remember PV over T for any condition, I now have all gas laws memorized. Just saying PV over T, and I can find any of those variables. Here's Boyle's law, PV equal PV. Charles' law, V over T is V over T. Gay-Lussac's law, P over T, all three of them combined together in one relationship creates what we call the combined gas law. Notice there is one variable still being held constant, and that's n, the number of moles, the number of particles inside of our containers. The gas relationship, PV over T, allows us to just find any of these, and if one is held constant, it simply falls out of the equation. No need to memorize three separate gas laws. Instead, work to understand the relationship so you can derive any of them. You need to just remember PV over T equal PV over T. Know this relationship and you'll have all the gas laws remembered. PV over T. So let's take a peek at an example of a combined gas law problem. And every time I read a number, I'm just going to assign a, a variable to it. A weather balloon contains 222 liters. That sounds like a volume unit, so I'm going to assign it a unit of V1. 20, 222 liters of helium at 20 degrees Celsius. Well, that's a temperature unit, so I'll assign it to the variable of T1. And the 760 mmHg, well, that's a pressure unit, so I'll assign in a variable of P1. We have our conditions of PV and T for set one. What is the volume of the balloon? So that looks like we're looking for V2. When it ascends to an altitude where the temperature is very cold, is negative 40 degrees Celsius, and the pressure up high, of course, would have dropped to 540 millimeters mercury. Remember the one relationship, PV over T, that it puts together all the variables holding N, the number of moles, constant. Now before we go further, let's remember to convert 273 to both of these. So we have three or 293 Kelvin. And if we subtract 40, we get 233 Kelvin units. So it's very cold. 273 minus 40 gets us, <laughs> yeah, 233 Kelvin units. So let's chug this in. Pressure one, 760 millimeter mercury. Sometimes you hear that called TOR, remember? V1, 222 liters over T1 in a Kelvin unit, 293 Kelvin equal. Well, here's our P2, 540 mmHg. Looking for V2 when the temperature is much colder now, 233 Kelvin units. How do we isolate V2? Well, we have a couple of different ways to tackle this. And again, I'll show a couple of ways just to see which one is most comfortable for you. The first is always to cross multiply the numbers that do not contain the variable. So I would set out by saying 760 times 222 times 233. Those are the three numbers that you multiply together when you cross multiply. Setting over the other direction, the two numbers that you multiply would be 293 times 540. And I'm going to remind you to put that in a parenthesis for order of operations. 
So this would be one method of solving that algebra. Cross multiply, divide by the other side. Some people like to simplify the left side first. And that's fine too, isn't it? So let's say method one, we cross multiplied. Start with the side without the variable, divide by the other two numbers. Another way to simplify the left side, and that's 13 simple way as well. So just to repeat, 760 times 222 over 293 set equal to 540 V2 over 233. What if I simplified this ratio right here? Let me just hit that on the calculator. So I did 760 times 222 divided by 293. And I, I get a number, but I'm not going to erase it from my screen because I don't want to simplify any numbers till the very end. But just so you can see what my screen is reading. It's got more decimals, but there, that's what I have so far. 760 times 222 times 293. That came to my calculator as 575.836, and it's got more decimals. That's equal to 540 V2 over 233. Now to isolate V2, you could simply keep this going. You could simplify 540 over 233. And then finally divide both sides. to isolate V2, and that cancels those two numbers. This to me is so much longer, but some people just really feel that it works better for them, and it's not my preferred mode, but I just wanted to show it. You could get to the answer really by simplifying each ratio as you go. My preferred method is right back up here, and I've yet to solve for it, and let's just make sure I, I do that as well. Your keys, going back to the first method, 760 times 222 times 233 and then just hit equal if you like and you get a number up here that is 39311760 and then on the bottom you get a number 293 times 540 and that's a number 158220 and when I solve for that I get 248.5. Is that the same number? Yeah, that got it either way, didn't we? Well, I prefer the cross multiplying and I wouldn't even um, write any of the intermediate work down. I would just keep it all on my calculator. My key sequence literally would look like this. 760 times 222 times 233 divided by parenthesis 293 times 540 close parenthesis and my screen would read 248.5 and when I think about that I should consider sig figs we're only allowed how many in the problem two sig figs so 248 with two sig figs would be 250 and we're looking for a volume, so that would be liters. So this one took me a little time to show you all the different ways to solve for V, and it's just whatever you prefer. You're all experienced algebra stars, I know that. And I just wanted to share a couple of different ways to solve for the volume. You find what works best for you and stick with it. This one works best for me. Let's try another. Here we have a pressure in a one liter balloon at 25 degrees Celsius. And the pressure is reading 750 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure? 
when it's cooled to negative 40 degrees, and the volume is two liters. All right, so I just generated a list. Every time I find a number, I associate the unit with that number, assigning it a variable. We have PVs over Ts. This is a job for a combined gas law. PV over T, so P1, 750 millimeters of mercury is our pressure. At the V1 given to us at one liter, and the T1, which is 298 Kelvin units. We're going to solve for P2 when the volume has changed to two liters and the new temperature is 233 Kelvin units. Always, always the Kelvin. Now remember this strategy. Start with cross multiplying the side without the variable first. So to isolate P2, I would hit 750 millimeter mercury times 1.0 liter times 233 Kelvin units. Then I would divide by parenthesis 298 times 2 close parenthesis equal. That is my key sequence. 750 times 1 times 233 divided by parenthesis 298 times 2 close parenthesis equal. That's my key sequence to isolate P2. Multiply the side as we cross multiply without the variable, divide by the other two numbers. Hit it with me. Let's be sure we're getting it right. Did you get a common answer of 293.2? Let me hit it again just to be sure. 750 times 1 times 233 divided by 298 times 2. Those are in a parenthesis. Yeah, I got it twice. So we're allowed two sig figs. So I would say 290 and that would come out then as a millimeter mercury the unit of pressure we put into the equation. Our combined gas law problems, PVs over Ts. Well, let's talk about that last variable, N, the number of particles. This is known as Avogadro's law. When the pressure and the temperature are held constant, the volume of a gas is proportional to the number of moles present. If I increase the number of moles, the volume expands. Now that makes sense if you just think about blowing up a balloon. When you add more and more and more air into the balloon, the volume gets bigger. So when N is increased from one to two moles, the volume has doubled. Adding more particles expands the volume when pressure and temperature are constant. So V over N equal V over N. Volume and the number of moles are constant. Let's take a look at this example to, mod to just model Avogadro's law. The average lungs of a male can hold 0.25 moles of air. the number of moles and the number of moles and the volume is 5.8 liters. How many moles of air did the lung of an average female hold if the volume is 4.6 liters? So the volume is directly related to the mole. 5.8 liters set over 0.25 moles will be set equal to 4.6 liters over N2. What we're looking for is the new number of moles. 
volume and moles are directly related. Let's solve for N2. Now remember our strategy, you cross multiply the sides without the variable first. So to isolate N2, we're gonna multiply 0.25 moles and 4.6 liters and set those over 5.8 liters. That's isolating N2. Cross multiply the sides without the variable, divide by the other number. My screen reads 0.198 and more letters, or 0.19827, I could keep going. There's a lot of them there. So how many are we allowed? Well, it looks like two sig figs in our problem. So we'll put um, 0 0.20 is two sig figs. Easy enough. When we think about Avogadro's law, there was another problem I accidentally hopped over. V over N equal V over N. So if we had 3.5 liters as our volume, when five moles of gas, looks like nitrogen in this example, let's calculate the new volume when each of the pressures and temperatures are constant, but the moles of nitrogen is changed to each of the following. So in letter A, here we'd have 2.5 moles. And in letter B, we'd have 3.65 moles. And in letter C, we have 21.5 moles. But we have the same left side of the equation every time. When that happens, we just cross multiply the sides without the variable first and divide by the other. So to isolate here, we would say 3.5 times 2.5 over five. Cross multiply the sides without the variable. Just to help you see the key sequence of solving for V2. Again, not necessary to show that all the time, but I just like to write more than necessary so you can see the key sequence. 3.5 times 2.5 over five. This is 1.75, so I'll keep our two sig figs and I'll put 1.8, and that would be a liter. 3.5 times 3.65 over five, 2.555 repeating, right? So 2.6 liters. Are these matching your page? How about the last one? What did you get? My screen reads 15.05 two sig figs, so I'll just leave 15 liters. That's big. Now, when we think about Avogadro's law, I wanted to just remind you, you've been staring at your mole map for a few chapters now, and I said, we're gonna, just one day, we're gonna go north to the land of the balloon, and today's the day. Avogadro's law really is nothing more than an application of the mole map. Often, amounts of gases are compared as a set of standard conditions. STP stands for standard temperature and standard pressure. Remember, standing at the sea level, the mercury column on our barometer would be 760 millimeters tall on a ruler stick. Standard pressure is one atmosphere, which is the same on a ruler stick as 760 millimeters for a mercury column in a barometer. On our temperature, using the thermometer, standard temperature is zero Celsius, but we know never to use Celsius in a problem, so we're remembering it as 273 Kelvin units. Any gas at STP, standard temperature and pressure, I don't care what the gas is, one mole of any gas occupies a volume of 22.4 liters. That's the size of this balloon. 22.4 liters is equivalent to the size of one mole. 
at STP. When you look at your mole map, you can see the 22.4 liters as our conversion factor between the world of moles and the world of volume. Remember, we always multiply to head out and we divide to head in. This is really just Avogadro's law. One mole of any gas at standard conditions occupies 22.4 liters. That's called the standard molar volume. Remember on this, we had something called molar mass, which is the weight of any compound off the periodic table. Here we have molar volume as our exchange unit, 22.4 liters. And here we had Avogadro's number as our exchange unit between counting and the mole. Now in chapter five, we spend a great deal of time traveling these two roads, weighing by counting, counting by weighing. We've just explored going north to the land of the balloon using molar volume of 22.4 liters. So remember, Avogadro's law says one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters, which means that it has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. That was Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So if I have one mole, I know I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. I would occupy a volume of 22.4 liters, but when I go out to the scale, atoms don't weigh the same. They have unique molar masses. So thinking about H2, well that's not H2, that should be He, helium. Helium weighs four on the periodic table. So a mole of helium would weigh four grams. Nitrogen weighs 14, so a mole of molecular nitrogen would weigh 28 grams. That's the molar mass Sometimes we called it formula weight. So let's practice one. This is just a, a friendly mole map problem. How many moles, so this is what I'm being asked for, are in two liters of nitrogen? So given two liters, I want to know how many moles. When you're going down this road map, you literally trip over your conversion factor, don't you? that 2.0 liters of the nitrogen can be converted into a mole by dividing by molar volume. This is the equivalent value. One mole of any gas occupies a volume of 22.4 and the nice words here at standard temperature and pressure because that must be true for this statement to hold up. STP conditions. If you're not at STP conditions, you know that temperature and pressure change the volume of a gas. So we have to assume STP to travel the mole map. Two divided by 22.4. This would have a value of 0.089, how many sig figs? Two, so point, yeah, that's two sig figs. 0 0.089 moles of nitrogen. Easy enough, isn't it? We just divided by molar volume to convert liters into moles. We followed the mole map heading in from the balloon towards the mole. How about another? Burning one mole of propane in a gas grill adds 132 grams of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. What volume of carbon dioxide does this correspond to? All right, so here's what we're being asked for. We want to know the volume. What volume of carbon dioxide at STP? But do you see what we're given? We're given 132 grams of carbon dioxide. So we're sitting here on the scale how many steps will this conversion involve? Good old mole map problem. I see that I have to head in to the mole and I do so I literally trip over my conversion factor, the molar mass of carbon dioxide. Carbon from the periodic table has an atomic weight of 12. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, but there's two of them in that formula, CO2, carbon dioxide. 
putting that together, the molar mass is 44 grams. So I need the molar mass to move from the scale to the mole, and then I need to go north to the balloon. That's where we'll use molar volume of 22.4 liters. So it will be a two-step journey to go from the scale up to the balloon. 132 grams of carbon dioxide can be converted into a mole by using its molar mass. One mole of carbon dioxide would weigh 44 grams. We did that right here. That brings us to the center of the mole map. I'm standing right here at the mole, and I want to go north to the balloon. And I can see heading out, I always multiply. There would be 22.4 liters in a mole of any gas. A two-step conversion where we divide by molar mass and multiply by molar volume. Well, let's see. 132 divided by 44 times 22.4. How big is that balloon? 67.2 liters. We were given three sig figs in the problem, so I'll leave that with three sig figs. Those aren't so bad, are they? Especially coming off of stoichiometry, you've got that all set. Should we try another? How many liters does each gas Given the following, let's see, how many liters does each of the following quantities of oxygen occupy at STP? Standard temperature pressure. So this right here, STP. I'm given the number of moles, and I want to just go to the volume. This is an easy one for letter A. Given a mole, it's a one-step problem. All I'm going to do is multiply by the molar volume multiplying to head out of the mole. 4.5 times 22.4, I hit that wrong the first time, is 100.8. We need two sig figs, don't we? So how do we do that? Keep the magnitude the same. I'm gonna use scientific notation. 1.0 times 10 squared is 100 with two sig figs, and my unit would be a liter. Letter B also gave me a mole, so this is nice. I'm at the mole, just standing right here in the center, and I wanna head out to the balloon. It's a one-step conversion where I employ the molar volume of 22.4 liters. So this time I just go 0.35 times the molar volume, 22.4, and I have 7.84 liters. Two sig figs, so let's convert that 7.8 liters. Now, what's different with letter C? Mm, I'm down here, aren't I? I'm given the scale. I have 18 grams of oxygen. How do I move from the scale to the mole and then north to the balloon? Well, I have to use the molar mass to convert from grams to moles. Remember we were given molecular oxygen? So each one weighs 16, so that's a molar mass of 32 grams. That's the weight of two oxygens added together. So starting at the scale, I have to do a conversion heading in. Heading in, you see you're tripping over that, molar mass is on the bottom. One mole of oxygen has a molar mass of 32 grams. Now I'm at the mole and can head north to the balloon using our molar volume of 22.4 liters. So a two-stepper for letter C. Let's hit that together, 18 over 32 times 22.4. And I had 12.6 come up on my screen, 12.6. How many sig figs? Oh, we're actually allowed three, so that's good. 12.6 liters will be my final answer. 100, 7.8, and 12.6. Does that match your page? You're doing really good work. How many moles are contained in each of the volumes? Well, 
pause this and just work ahead. This is simple. I just want to make sure you're understanding how to travel the mole map. Take a moment and solve these. Come back to me when ready. One point five liters starts us at the balloon and we're going to go into the mole. Notice how molar volume is on the bottom. We divide to head in. So here we want to set one mole over 22.4 liters. 1.5 divided by 22.4 and we get 0 0.0669. So let's do two sig figs. Letter B. We're starting with 8.5 liters and we know that one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters. Eight and a half divided by the molar volume of 22.4. Let's see, two sig figs in my answer, 0.38. Now letter C is a little tricky, kind of, just that notice our conversion is a liter. So when I start out, make sure that you did this first. We have to say that the liter unit is always required to use the molar volume of 22.4 liters. So now just make sure that you moved your decimal so that you ended with a liter unit to go out of the balloon. So 25 divided by a thousand converts your millis into the liter unit and then I can divide that by 22.4. We get a really tiny number, 0 0.00111, yeah, so 0011 moles. Are you doing good? <laughs> oh, nothing like some good mole map problems. How long have we been talking? Oh, about half an hour. So I'm gonna keep going and look at the ideal gas law with you and continuing our lesson. If you need a break, you are certainly allowed to just pause the video and come back. But I think I'd like to push through and keep talking about the PVs and Ts and finally introduce the last of our variables, N, the number of moles. When all four properties of a gas are invited into the same equation, we come up with the ideal gas law. Now, here's what we said. Here's Boyle's law, P times V equal P times V. Charles law, V over T. Avogadro's law, V over N. These are all relationships that hold true. Pressure and temperature directly related. Volume and moles directly related. Pressure and volume inversely related. All of these are placing the same four variables into one equation. So if you had two sets of equations, you would say, here's the initial and here's the final conditions. And again, this combined gas law puts all the variables into one spot. I don't need to keep memorizing separate equations. PV over NT, one equation gets me everywhere. Now, at standard conditions, and what I mean by that is by saying STP, I'm going to employ Avogadro's law. Let me just write that again. Avogadro says one mole of any gas occupies a volume of 22.4 liters at standard conditions, right? At STP, that's the north to the balloon. So why don't we do this? I wanna just rearrange this PV over NT, and I wanna solve for R, which is going to be called the ideal gas constant. And what I'll do to solve for R is place in all of those variables that Avogadro told us. So in other words, let's say at standard conditions, STP, let's say we know that's one atmosphere and we know that's 273 Kelvin units. 
I also know that STP can be measured with 760 as the measurement for millimeters of mercury. I mean, I just know that there's more than one pressure unit. Let's use STP and solve for R, the ideal gas constant. And I'm going to use pressure in one atmosphere first. When I have one atmosphere of pressure, the volume of my balloon would be 22.4 liters big if I had one mole at standard pressure and standard temperature. Do you see how all of these are standard numbers? One mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters at standard conditions, standard pressure, standard temperature. Let's solve for R. And when I do that, I'm just going to say 1 times 22.4 divided by 1 and 273. Now my screen reads 0.08205. I'm going to round that to 0821. And keep in mind the unit here would be an atmosphere liter over mole Kelvin. When the pressure is measured in atmosphere, R is a constant, 0.0821. I remember that as August 21st. It helps me remember the, the number, August 21st, 0821. <laughs> so when I'm looking at any type of ideal gas law constant, R is determined by the pressure unit you put in. And I said a moment ago, what if instead of atmospheres, what if we used millimeter of mercury? That standard pressure in a millimeter of mercury is 760. And I will plug in all the standard numbers again and solve for R. If I used 760 instead, so 760 times 22.4 divided by 273. And this is a number on my screen, I'll just round a little bit, 62.4. And that comes out to me as a millimeter mercury liter over mole Kelvin, the unit on the R constant. So when I'm looking at the ideal gas equation, here is my combined gas law, PV over NT. PV over NT is our combined gas law, and I set that equal to R, and I solved for R. And we just rearrange this equation to make it a little friendlier, right? We're gonna bring the NT up to this side, and that's how we come up with the ideal gas law, just rearranging it. PUV equals NERT, PUV NERT. Now I can remember those variables so easy. Puvnerts. We're going to practice some Puvnert problems. PV equal NRT. What does P stand for? Well, that's pressure. What does V stand for? Well, that's volume. What does N stand for? Well, that's the number of moles. What does R stand for? That's the constant. And what does the T stand for? Well, that's temperature. Now let's, let's think this through a little bit. I said that if pressure was measured in an atmosphere, what was the volume of R? If pressure is in an atmosphere, R is 0.0821. But if pressure is measured in a millimeter mercury, what is the R value? Mm, that was our value that we wrote down is 62.4. So whatever pressure unit you put NERT with, make sure you put in a matching R constant. Match the pressure unit and the R value. The other considerations, when we solved for R, we used liters, didn't we? So when I'm looking at this guy volume, he must be in a liter unit. 
must be, or I didn't solve for R correctly. And the other guy, remember, Calvin temperatures, always, always for your temperature. The unit you place in for pressure determines the R constant. Volume will be a liter, N stands for moles, and T for Calvin temperature. Puv equals nert. Are you ready to try one? I already did this, didn't I, on the previous slide. This is where we wrote down our values for one mole of any gas occupying a volume of 22.4 liters. R, if the pressure is in atmospheres, was 0.0821 liter times atmosphere over Kelvin mole. And if R is in a millimeter mercury, it was 62.4 liter MMHG Kelvin mole. Those are constants you need to memorize. Now, you ready to practice one? How many moles of a gas are contained in a typical human breath that takes five liters of air at one atmosphere and the body temperature of 37 degrees? Now, when I put NERT, I like to just get my parentheses ready. In other words, here I know that PV equals NRT. Get your variables ready. PV equals NRT. So that way when I read this sentence, I now know to just plug into the correct parentheses. How many moles? Well, that means I'm gonna solve for N, right? That's my target variable. The volume must be in a liter, and it is, so that's good, 0.5 liters. The pressure is given to me as one atmosphere. And now remember, as soon as you know P, you also know R. Pressure is measured in an atmosphere, so we have to use the appropriate R constant, 0.0821 liter atmosphere over Kelvin mole. Temperature is 310 Kelvin units. PV equal NRT, PUV equal NERT. We're going to solve for the number of moles. To isolate N, you can see PV over RT. So just kind of starting on the side without the variable first. That would be the P times V does not contain the variable. And then divide by the other side. So over here, you'd have R times T. And just make sure you're putting that in a parenthesis. So your key sequence here would have one atmosphere times 0.5 liters divided by the R constant, 0.0821, times 310, close parentheses, and you'll have N. The number of moles is what N stands for. 1 times 0.5, divide by parentheses, 0.0821, times 310, close parentheses, 0.0196. Uh, two sig figs, so there we have two sig figs, 0 0.020 moles of a gas. We just did our first Pivnert problem. How's that feel? PV over RT isolated N. The number of moles is N. Let's try another. If a person exhales 25 grams of carbon dioxide in an hour, what volume does this amount occupy at one atmosphere in 37 degrees Celsius? Well, I'm gonna get my Pivnert parentheses ready. I know that P times V will equal NRT. I'm not hearing a G for grams anywhere. This is not a Pivgert problem, is it? It's a Pivnert problem. 
So my 25 grams of carbon dioxide has to be converted into a mole. And to do so, we use the mole map. 25 grams of carbon dioxide needs to be divided by its molar mass, which we did just a minute ago. Carbon is 12, 14, and 44 grams as its molar mass. And this then will come out with the number of moles of carbon dioxide. 25 over 44, this gives me 0.568. And since I had three sig figs here, I'm going to carry three sig figs into the problem. Now that's N, the number of moles in my PUV-NERT problem. So it's not PUV-GERT, it's PUV-NERT. If I'm given a mass, just do a simple mole map problem and get it into the mole. 0.568 moles is the value of N. What volume, so that's going to be my target variable, does this amount occupy at one atmosphere? Well, that's a pressure unit. And as soon as I know ATM, I also know R. R has a value, a constant you must remember as 0.0821. I told you it reminds me of August 21st. If that helps you with a calendar date to help you remember R, it helps me. That's a liter atmosphere. Calvin mole. That's what a derived unit is to make you remember the atmosphere unit matches 0.0821. And then 37 in a Kelvin unit is our 310 temperature. We're looking for volume. So remember, start on the side without the variable first. Simplify the right side. NERT over P. So your key sequence would hit 0 0.568 times 0 0.0821 times 310, and then you would divide that by your one atmosphere. I have 14.46. How many sig figs? Three, whoops, the temperature is two, so we'll give it to two sig figs. We'll round it to 14, and that would come out as a liter. How'd you do? You just did another PUVNERT problem. Just a little smidge different because we had a little mole map side work to do to get an N, the number of moles, when given the grams of carbon dioxide. I'll emphasize, remember, it's not a PUV-GERT, it's a PUV-NERT, where moles are necessary. You try one, come back to me when ready. Pause the video and work this out, see if we got the same answer. Getting my parentheses ready for PUV equals NERT. The volume, how many moles? We're looking for moles. Five liters is your volume. Pressure, 175 atmospheres. So that matches the R constant, 0.0821. Temperature had to go in as 293 Kelvin units. Are you remembering your parentheses when you hit that out? Solving for P times V over RT, 175 times 5 divided by, oh, I hit that wrong already, 175 times 5 over R times T. How about 36.37, we'll need Consider that, so we'll round to two sig figs. That's two right there, two right here. So two sig figs is 36 
moles. 175 times 5 divided by parentheses 0821 times 293. Yep, 36 moles of oxygen. Well, that makes sense because this is a very, very high pressure. It's going to take a whole lot of particles to get a pressure that high. Did you get a correct answer? I'm sure you did. How about some more? Determine the pressure in atmospheres under each of the following conditions. So if I'm looking for pressure when the volume is 10 liters, 0.45 moles, selecting the matching R constant, and the temperature in a Kelvin unit, 298 Kelvin. We're looking for pressure when I had a 5 liter volume, 10 grams of nitrogen. Well, that had to be a little mole map problem, didn't it? So you had to find the molar mass of nitrogen to get an N. Remember, it's not puv gert, it's puv nert. So 10 grams divided by the molar mass of nitrogen, 28. That was our 0.357. I'll keep all three sig figs. Here's your matching R constant, 0821. And the temperature is 20, so that's 293 Kelvin units. So remember, to solve for P, you're going to start on the right side and isolate pressure. NRT over P, NRT over V, isolates the pressure. Let's hit these to be sure we get them right. How about 1.10, so two sig figs, 1.1. Does that match your page? And here, 0.357 times 0821 times 293 over 5. Here I have 1.7 ATMs. You're doing Pugnert work. How's it feel? Pretty good. We've been talking oh, about 52 minutes. Um, so you know what? This is such an easy section. I am going to just push through. Again, if you need a break, please take one. But I'm going to push through this next section because it is simple. It is so easy. We're adding and subtracting. We might as well just do that on this video as well. And this kind of wraps up all of the gas talk. And we all have had accomplishment then of two lessons for gas laws. So the last gas law presents Dalton's law of partial pressure. And in words, we're simply going to say the total pressure of a gas in a mixture is the sum of all the partial pressures of its components. So let's suppose, if you will, I have a container that contains a blue molecule and it's exerting a pressure as five atmospheres. And in a separate container of equal size, I have a red molecule that's exerting a pressure of three atmospheres. Notice that it's just matching the number of particles. Five particles gives me five atmospheres of pressure. Three particles gave me three atmospheres of pressure independently in separate containers. What if I put them together in the same container, same size, same temperature, what happens to the total pressure? Well, you got it. You just add them together. So if particle A gave me five atmospheres, it still is in this one. If particle B gave me three atmospheres, it still is. And so the new combined pressure is simply the sum. That's as easy as this gets. You add the partial pressures to find the total pressure in the system. So here I said partial pressure of gas A plus the partial pressure of gas B gave me the total pressure in the system. P sub T is the total pressure. That's what I said 5 plus 3 gave me 8 atmospheres. However many gases you have, if you have three individual gases, you just sum the individual pressures to find the total pressure. I know, right? It's kind of easy. 
So when we take a look at um, Dalton's law, it's really just adding and subtracting. Let's model one here. A sample of exhaled air from the lungs contains a mixture of four gases. The first of those gases is nitrogen. The partial pressure, notice how I'm writing capital P and then kind of small n2, we're going to read that as the partial pressure of nitrogen is given to me as 563 millimeters of mercury. That's the first of the gases. Then it says oxygen, so the partial pressure of oxygen, notice it's a capital P and then I just put O2 kind of small next to it as partial pressure of oxygen is how we read that is 118 millimeters of mercury. There's a fourth, a third gas, carbon dioxide, and it's contributing 30 millimeters of mercury to the total pressure. And we have some water vapor, and it's contributing 50 millimeters of mercury pressure. What is the total pressure? I know, I wish we had a whole test of these, right? We know that the total pressure is equal to the sum of all of the individual contributions from those four gases. So I'm knowing that the sum of each pressure will give me the total pressure. So it's as easy as saying 563 plus 118 plus 30 plus 50. I added those together and the total pressure came out to the sum of 761 mmHgs, millimeters of mercury. I know, you're welcome. This one was an easy one. Dalton's law of partial pressure. Each individual gas contributes to the total pressure. To find that, just sum their values. Let's try an example with air. Air is a mixture of 21% oxygen. It is comprised of 78% of nitrogen and 1% argon by volume. What is the partial pressure of each gas at sea level where the total pressure is 760 mmHgs? So if this is the total pressure The contribution of each gas is just based on its percentage of its contribution. When I write 21%, think of that as being 21 parts out of 100 parts. 21% of 760 gives me the partial pressure of oxygen. 78% of 760 would give me the contribution from the element nitrogen. And 1% of 760 would give me the partial pressure of argon. And those will sum to be 760. So percentages, parts out of 100 parts. 21 over 100, of course, is 0 0.21 times 760. The partial pressure of oxygen is 159.6 millimeters of mercury. 78 over 100 is 78 percent times 760. Partial pressure of nitrogen is 592.8. And then 1 over 100 is 1 percent times 760. That comes out to 7.6 millimeters of mercury. And then just considering rounding to give us uh, sig figs, this could be 160, this could be 593, and this could still be 7.6. So you could consider rounding there and working it into the number of sig figs you'd like to report. Probably two for each one, but then we wouldn't have 100% overall. So. We're just showing the math here of taking percent times the total to find each contribution, and then we should consider sig figs. Let's take a peek at this guy, nitrox. It's a gas mixture used in scuba diving, and it contains a higher than normal level of oxygen, 
and a lower than normal level of nitrogen. And they do that on purpose to help reduce the risk of the bends. Remember I started our lesson uh, when we first started our chapter talking about the bends. If you come up from scuba diving too quickly, your blood will actually start bubbling with nitrogen gas. Notice that the tank is reading 3,500 pounds per square inch. That's a number we had to read to find the percent of nitrogen and oxygen in this given tank. Well, let's count. Noticing that oxygen is going to be represented by the red, there are three oxygen molecules as compared to one, two, three, four, five nitrogen molecules. So looking at this contribution, the total number of molecules is eight. So the percent here, three molecules of oxygen out of an eight total would give me its percentage in the tank. And then of course, 35 PSI, 350. The nitrogen would be the remaining percentage. So three over eight is the percentage of nitrogen in the gas, right? So three over eight, this tells me, and then times a hundred. And then of course, five over eight expressed as a percent. You could simply take that value and subtract it from a hundred. You could say, five divided by eight and express that as 62.5% nitrogen. And that's just giving us how many, it's, you know, how many total molecules we're contributing out of the total number. There's three red molecules out of eight that represents the oxygen. There's five molecules out of eight representing the nitrogen. So that breaks down to its percentage. And we can use that percentage then to find its contribution to the total pressure. And that's just what I had set up instinctively without solving for the percentage. 3,500 times three over eight gives me the partial pressure of oxygen. And that comes out to me as 1,3,1,2.5. And let's see, I'll just keep that as 1,3,1,3. One, three, one, three. And that comes out as PSI. And the partial pressure of nitrogen then would be five over eight times 3,500. And I'll round that as well to 2188 PSIs. These Dalton's Law, they're the beans, aren't they? They're really nice. Let's stop our video lesson here. We've concluded the gas laws. We'll come back and talk about liquids. And then in the last video, we'll talk about solids. We're doing great work.